In a recent video I made, I made the claim that when you go in and you want to syntax a document, you have to take the entire scenario of the document, all the words and phrases into consideration before you bank your syntax values, i.e. you can't just go in and put a one up above a the or an a or something like that because that word may also be um, a verb or a pronoun. Same thing with ly words. Now, I made the claim that you could go into a document with confidence and syntax the conjunctions of which there are two and an or and go in and put a zero above them with confidence and uh, knowing that you'll be doing the correct thing because my premise was conjunctions are neutral. They don't affect the syntax. They're just bridges of sorts. Again, in compliance with uh, rule one, rule equal judge mechanics, you must look at the entirety of the scenario. And so I found an exception to that scenario. And I'm going to share it with you here for the closure. So the first sentence will illustrate and give continue to the evidence of the claim that I made that you can go in and if you see a conjunction you can bank your neutral zero value over that conjunction. And then you can go in and syntax it forwards or backwards. I suggest that beginners start from the end and work backwards. It's much more efficient and accurate, I've found, in the two years of teaching this, that, that students learning it just much more accurate. But I'll do it from the beginning. And what I see here is a tangible contract pronoun, eat. And then I see... A non-tangible contract adverb, we know that nothing can follow a pronoun except for a break in the continuance of the evidence or an adverb, which basically functions as a break in the continuance of the evidence because it's pure modification. There's nothing there but modification. What's it modifying? The tangible contract veggies into a verb. Now we have our neutral conjunct position. Then we have another tangible contract verb and then another conjunction. And then the final dangling participle verb, tangible contract brief. And that's the scenario I was talking about. But then I realized there's another scenario. This one, which would function as the exception to what I just said there. And there always seems to be one of those exceptions. Now if you look at this, utilizing judgeship mechanics... Rule one, rule equal with the honor and the grace. We would be exercising the grace here because I don't want to be misunderstood. And I don't want someone to misunderstand me. And I want to give someone, whoever the author is of this or whatever, every chance to stop and correct and understand what they're doing with their grammar. Because obviously, they haven't given me closure on what's going on here. But as we are taught from kindergarten on up, we are taught to assume and presume what's going on here. What I see here in the fiction, I only see one word in this sentence functioning as a conjunction. So going by this, you would think, okay, you're going to go in and do this. However, that would not be correct. Because only one word functions as a conjunction. I mean, it wouldn't be correct in the scenario I'm outlining for you here with the maintenance of the rule one, rule equal, honor and grace, judge mechanics. And is a non-tangible contract pronoun, much like that up there, even though it's non-tangible. And or is a non-tangible contract pronoun. And then we have nothing follows a pronoun, except for breaking the continuance of the evidence or an adverb. And this follows that rule right there. So we have pronoun, conjunction, pronoun, adverb, dangling, participle, verb. And as a non-tangible contract pronoun, then we have our neutral value of zero and functioning as a, pro, as a conjunction. And then we have non-tangible contract or functioning as a pronoun. Nothing can follow a pronoun except for a break in the continuance of the evidence and an adverb. We have Non-tangible contract R, functioning as pure modification, modifying tangible contract conjunctions into a dangling participle verb. Why is it a dangling participle verb? 
because in the correct sentence structure, we have our cause, concern, then we put our verb into thinking in because we have our two points with which to draw a straight line, then we drop our verb into thinking in. It has a very specific function. It is an R, two verbs, singular plural. Then we move on with the rest of the claim, the possessive concern, possessive authority. Here, the verb's just dangling there. Verb is thinking. There's nothing left to think about. It's not telling us what to think about. It's just modified our verb of the thinking into this tangible contract conjunctions. So the purpose of this was to show that if you run into this scenario, this is one way to do it. This is the way I would do it. Uh, and um, I don't think you'll run into this very often. This is the most common type of scenario. But the, the latter scenario is not a very common one. But I wanted to put it out there for the sake of the rule one, rule equal, and sharing knowledge, because I don't think any knowledge having to do with this should be kept from the public. So I'm sharing everything I got on my YouTube channel, which you're watching right now. If you have any grammar questions, feel free to contact me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. And uh, I thank you very much for watching.